the simplest and most widely used machines is the lever. The old-fashioned pump works on its principle. So does the boat oar. And since the beginning of recorded history, the crowbar. Man has used the crowbar to pry up heavy weights without straining himself. In the old days, it was found to be a lot easier to raise water with a lever set up like this. A heavy stone balanced the weight of the bucket and lightened the work. This simple bar working on a pivot or fulcrum was the beginning of great things. When the fulcrum is in the center, a weight at one end is balanced by an equal weight at the other end. But if we put the fulcrum off center so that the lever has a long and a short arm, a small weight can balance a big weight. If the long arm is three times the length of the short arm, the small weight can balance a weight three times its size. Instead of a small weight, a small force can balance the big weight. And if we increase the force just a little, the big weight is raised. But to do this, the force has to move a greater distance than the weight. The crowbar, of course, is the classic example of this fact. Now, if we move the fulcrum to the other end, we have to apply a big force to move a little weight. But this time, the weighted end of the bar has to move farther than the end receiving the pressure. As people had to go deeper into the earth for water, the well sweep was replaced by the windlass. The handle of a windlass is really a lever. By adding more handles or levers, more than one man could work the windlass. And the increasing number of handles on the windlass may have led to the development of the toothed wheel and a tremendous advancement in civilization. In desert countries, animals could now be used to raise water for irrigation. The levers of one toothed wheel were made to push around those of another wheel equipped with buckets. A continuous flow of water resulted. Even these crude gear wheels made it possible to change the direction of turning. The wheel with the buckets had to turn vertically while the animal-driven wheel had to. This has always been the role of the gear wheel to make one part of a machine serve its other parts. The rushing streams in hilly countries afforded the opportunity to take advantage of water power to grind grain. In this primitive Norwegian mill, the water was diverted down a chute against the small levers of a paddle wheel. A shaft connected the paddle wheel with the millstone so that the levers pushed it around. It worked, but it was too small to be efficient. By getting the paddle wheel upright, it was found its size could be increased to take better advantage of the water power in the stream. A big water wheel could be used to drive two or even three sets of millstones, simply because it had more leverage through its upright position. But the millstones were horizontal, so gears were needed to change the direction of turning. And there was another problem. The big water wheel could turn only at a slow speed. So gears were added to increase the speed for grinding grain. The gear wheel was growing up. It could serve to change direction of turning, and it could serve to increase speed. Let's see how this is done. The big gear wheel has three times as many teeth as the other, and is doing the driving. When the big wheel turns around once, it drives the smaller wheel around three times. One, two, three. So the little wheel turns three times as fast as the big wheel. But there is one-third less turning power to be set against this gain in speed. Gear wheels, remember, are a system of levers. The lever allows us to interchange force and distance. 
the gear wheel allows us to adjust turning power and speed according to the needs of the machine. In the same way, a small gear wheel can drive a large one. Then there is a reduction of speed, but an increase in turning power. At first, gears were used mostly for speeding up the movement of slow, unwieldy sources of power, such as the water wheel. In flat countries, there was no water power, but there was wind, and the people turned this natural power to good use. They used the windmill to grind their grain into flour. The wind was caught by large blades or veins, really levers again. They couldn't turn fast because of their size and weight, but they were very powerful. connected the veins with a big toothed wheel. A small gear converted the slow power of the veins into speed that could grind the grain. At the same time, the direction of turning had to be changed. The small wheel was called a lantern wheel, and even though it was crudely built, it ran very well. But the bars of the lantern wheel wore away in a short time, and having to replace them so often was a nuisance. As millwrights became more skilled, they learned to make another type of gear wheel called a spur wheel. It wasn't as easy to make and had to be fitted more exactly, but it lasted much longer and required fewer repairs. The carpenters learned by experience how to shape the teeth so they would mesh easily. The combination of wind and gears turned the millstones. The wind gave the power and the gears the means to use it. But the miller himself had to control his machine. The millstones had to be kept running at the right speed or the flour would be too coarse. uses for wind power too. With the help of geared shafts, he got his sacks of grain hoisted up to the top of the mill. Other mills were built for different purposes. Flat countries were easily flooded. But with the help of gears, windmills could be used to return the flood waters to the rivers. Wind power was used for crushing oil out of nuts and seeds, and for sawing wood. common sight throughout the Middle Ages, and its slow speeds permitted the use of wooden gears. But a new age was coming. New uses for metal were being discovered. Mines had to be dug deep into the earth. Water had to be drained from them and the crude water engines that were available weren't equal to the job. Steam was harnessed to serve the new need. But the first steam engines had no gear wheels. Steam drove a lever up and down. This lever, the walking beam, carried the power of the steam across to the pump. So the lever was used to drain deep mines and help man in his search for metal. But the age of wind and water power and the simple wooden gear was coming to an end. The machine age had begun. Cotton 
cotton goods were wanted for the growing world trade. Machines were invented to weave it. They needed gears that would last, gears made of metal. Power to work the machines came from the steam engine. But now the steam engines needed gears. Gears to change their simple up and down action into turning action. And the metal gear wheels needed lubrication. Simple lubricants such as animal fats were used. The metal gear wheels also had to be engineered with some precision now. As an early engineer described in a textbook written in 1809, in the construction of machines, he wrote, the proper formation of the teeth of wheels is an object of much importance. The best figure, therefore, which can be given to the teeth is that which shall cause them always to act equally favorable. I shall now proceed to show, he said, that the epicycloid gives the property to the teeth of wheels required in the preceding proposition. Now, epicycloid isn't as bewildering as it sounds. When a circle rolls along a line, a fixed point on it traces a special curve known as the cycloid. If we make the circle roll around another circle, we get what is known as the epicycloid curve. And we need that curve for the design of cycloidal gear teeth. And still another curve is needed, the hypocycloid curve that is created the same way, but inside the circle. This new precise knowledge about the shape of gear teeth replaced the old haphazard knowledge. Gear wheels could be made more efficiently and at the same time more easily. Wooden patterns cut to shape were used to make a mold in sand. The skill of the workman was still needed, but now his job was easier. He had merely to carry out other men's ideas with thoroughness. gear wheel. Later, wheels were cast as blanks without teeth. It was learned that machines themselves could make gear wheels and make them more accurately. But an objection was found to the cycloidal form of gear teeth. As soon as there was any wear on teeth or bearings, the gears would not run smoothly. A new curve was investigated, the involute. The involute curve is traced by a fixed point on a straight line as it rolls around the circle. the teeth can roll and slide a little, but always with a smooth movement. Involute wheels ran well, even when slightly worn. And there was another advantage. 
The simpler curve of the involute gear permitted more accurate machining methods. And for the first time, various size gear wheels became interchangeable. They no longer had to be made in matched sets. This helped in the development of the lathe, the machine that has contributed most to modern industry. For the lathe and the gear wheel are responsible for the machine shop, the source of everything from table knives to locomotives. Less than a century ago, two great discoveries made possible the machine age as we know it today. In England, Bessemer invented a process for making steel in large quantities. Drake discovered oil in Pennsylvania. Steel gave the material for making strong, long-lasting gear wheels. The new lubricants from petroleum allowed them to run faster and to stand up to loads that had never been known before. The early automobile, a product of the machine shop and powered by gasoline, was a typical outgrowth of the new age of steel and petroleum. And like many other machines, the automobile utilizes the principle of the lever through its gears. The engine runs fast and its speed has to be brought down. This is done partly in the rear axle and partly in the transmission, shown here in simple form. When a car gets underway or goes uphill, a small gear drives a large one. This allows the engine to run fast while the car itself goes slow. The result is strong pull but low speed. For higher speeds, another pair of gears nearer the same size are used. These gears used to run faster and the engine slower, thus giving more speed, but in turn less pull. Actually, the transmission in modern cars has three or more combinations of gears for forward speeds and a special combination for reverse. Gear wheels for automobiles and other heavy working machines are given what might be called an extra hard skin. For instance, the wheels may be baked in a substance containing carbon. The carbon unites with the metal and gives it a skin that makes it extremely hard and durable. This is frequently called case hardening. The gray core of these test bars is tough so that it can stand heavy shocks. The bright skin after another heat treatment will be hard and brittle. Case hardened gears stand up better to knocks, but the knocks themselves can be greatly reduced by cutting the gear teeth slantwise to give what is known as a helical gear. With this gear, the action of the teeth is more gentle and smooth. The high power transmission in modern cars results in extreme pressures on the gear teeth, but they can stand the strain because of heat treating processes and modern lubricants, including the special gear oils developed by the petroleum industry. Discoveries about gears were not limited to automobiles. This huge gear wheel is for a mill for rolling steel. It has two sets of teeth cut on opposite slants or in herringbone fashion. Then the side strain from the teeth cut on one slant is offset by the teeth with the opposite slant. Electricity makes its own demands on the toothed wheel. The high speeds of electric motors usually have to be reduced for practical use. This may be done with a worm gear that uses the principle of the screw. The screw itself is a special kind of lever. The worm gear gives a big reduction in speed and requires a special oil, for there is a constant rubbing friction on a worm gear and no rolling friction. The gears must be perfectly fitted together. Frequent checks are necessary to be sure that the worm gear and its wheel are running smoothly. The high-speed steam turbine drives ships and electric generators. Steam blows these curved blades around at enormous speeds. The blades are levers. Before the power can be used, in most cases, the speed has to be reduced. Huge gear wheels driven by a very small pinion give this speed reduction. The wheels run in a bath of oil, but because they turn so rapidly, they fling it off. So oil is forced onto the gear teeth by oil jets. As new high speeds were developed, more accuracy and precision were called for, and precision machine work led to such marvels as the epicyclic gear and the inexpensive but reliable watch. 
business itself runs on the oiled gear wheels of the adding machine. And the performance of modern industry is due largely to the adaptability of gears to the demands of invention. But the gears themselves, though refined and improved, remain the same in principle. The toothed wheel discovered ages ago and the gigantic and smooth running gears of today all spring from the same principle. The principle of the lever with its ability to multiply a small force into something tremendous.